Welcome to The Mountain Gardener with your host, Ken Lane. Gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and local advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. And you have tuned in to The Mountain Gardener. This is your host, Ken Lane. We're here each week talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona. And this is what we're famous for. This is the reason people move to the high country of Arizona. It's just gorgeous. Yes, it's four seasons, but it's as mild as you can get. And the seasons linger. They just are meant to be enjoyed in the mountains of Arizona. The fall color has been over the top. It started what, three, four, three weeks ago at least, maybe, maybe four, up in Flagstaff, the aspens, whole groves, the entire hillsides of, of Mount Humphrey is just a glow. It's beautiful. And it's just spectacular. People come up from the deserts. The flatlanders drive up to the high country to enjoy what we just take for granted sometimes. It's really, really nice. And it'll keep doing this. Now, we can get cool. And then it will warm back up. It'll get cool, then it'll warm back up. It's just really nice. It's as mild as you can get for a four-season climate. Here, what I wanted to, to give you is a list of the best of the fall-colored trees. And what are the best varieties, the hardiest varieties for any elevation that we have here in the mountains of Arizona? So this would be from you folks down in, in Camp Verde, Cottonwood, all the way up to Flagstaff, and then that ridge line from Kingman to Payson, here are the best fall colored trees. And I organized them by colors. So I wanted to give you a list of what are, what are you seeing out there in the landscape? What, what are you, what are you seeing on Facebook? I mean, I have, I don't know how many Facebook posts from friends going, look at this one. Oh, look at this one. It's out on my morning hike. Look at this one. Oh, we had my dog and I went to look at this one. It's just, uh, it's inspiring. It brings out the little kid in you when you see those golden, red, orange, purple foliage dropping from, from the trees and shrubs. So I thought I'd go down the list of what can you plant now and uh, would enjoy that fall color. And, and let me describe or, or explain why this is such an ideal time to be planting trees. The, the book says this is the perfect fall. It's the perfect time. Fall is for planting. But let me tell you why. What happens as, that, as our temperatures drop down into the 60s, the trees actually start to shut down. And so they'll, they'll, they'll stop growing at the top growth, but they're actively growing at the root level. And so they're bringing all those carbohydrates and sugars down from the foliage, down from the stems, and they're actually storing that in the root structure. So if you put a tree in the ground right now, you'll actually get a burst of root growth right as you go into winter. And then next spring, it will use that roots to elongate even more growth next spring. So you'll have a, a larger, better, hardier tree next spring by planting in the fall. And there's virtually zero chance of transplant shock. And so it just, it, again, it's starting to shut down. So it's starting to go into dormancy. And so you, you, can, you can get that plant to, to take almost 100% of the time. It's, it's really a noticeable uptick on success rate. The insider secret. Here's what you have to remember if you're going to plant anything in the fall of the year, whether it's an evergreen, a fall-colored tree, whatever it is. The secret is to water until the ground literally freezes. And so this is really for you folks up in Flagstaff, maybe Williams, the rest of us, our ground doesn't freeze. I think last year I might have had a, a half an inch of, of frozen soil. I picked right through it. It was fine. But you want to keep watering those trees as they really harden off and, and freeze into the ground. That's really for you folks in Flag. The rest of us, we're going to water right through winter, at least twice a week, or twice, excuse me, twice a month. You want to deep water those plants that were planted in the fall. The rest of them, you're probably hardy enough, although they would benefit as well from a deep soak at least, at least once a month. I would say twice a month, and you can cut one of those out if we have a heavy storm or a real wet cycle. But if you recall, those of you that wintered with us last year, 
it was bone dry. I mean, it, we didn't see moisture from November through March. It was crazy. I mean, I haven't seen anything like it. Usually March is a wet month for us and not last year. So you just never know what you're going to be given any given season. So to the insurance, the insurance is water twice a month and that your plants will just come right through like champions. If you don't do that, a dry plant comes out of winter damage. We call it winter burn or winter kill or the tops of the, your evergreen hedges will be burned back. Uh, so your, your, tr- the tips of your trees will be burned back. Your, your flower buds on your fruit trees won't quite, they won't open. They won't have as many. It's all because they went through a cold spell and they were dry. And so that's the secret with, with planting in the fall or anything since summer through, through autumn, I would say this is something you'll need to, to get your plants through safely, uh, to doing, to ensure that you have a, a good growth next spring, a good flush of, of candle growth on those evergreens or a good burst of, of leaf growth on those deciduous trees. That's, that's the insider trait. That's, that's how you really make them go. I would go so far as to say, if the weatherman comes, let's say in January, he goes, Oh boy, we've got a cold one coming out of the Northwest. You better be careful. Batten down the hatches. It's going to be cold. Make sure you water your plants before that cold hits. A hydrated plant goes through cold without any worries, any problems, a dry plant. This is counterintuitive. What you think you think if I'm wet and I'm outside, I'll be, I'll get cold. Trees have naturally occurring antifreeze up and down the stems of inside the inner structure of their being. If you keep it moist, it can move that antifreeze up and down the structure of the plant. If it gets dry, it can't do that. And so it starts to sacrifice the top or the tips of that growth. It just, it brings all that antifreeze down towards this core or the, the, the main structure of that tree. So it won't die. It's a protective thing that it does. If you simply hydrate right before a real cold cycle, especially your container gardens, like I grow roses, I've got fruit trees and containers, figs. I've been picking figs like crazy, all grown in containers. Make sure those are especially moist as we go into that cold cycle. That makes sense. Okay, enough said. Let's go down. I'm, I don't have get the list is too long to go down this segment. Let, get your pen and paper out. We'll go a couple minutes worth of trees, and then I'll finish at the bottom of the hour, and then we'll bring Lisa in with her with your questions you've had this week. But let's just go down the reds. What are the best reds right now? The autumn blaze maple and the flame maples have been spectacular. Oh my goodness, they're gorgeous. Yeah, uh, they're they're the traditional leaf maples. Now one is short. The flame maple only gets maybe. 10, 12 feet tall. It's a shorty. It's like a Japanese maple, but it takes our wind, our sun. It's actually considered a drought hardy. It's part of the zero scape, a low fire, fire wise kind of plants. It's got a small maple leaf that is flaming red. thus the name flame maples. And it's a, it's a usually multi-stemmed type of tall bush or short tree. Think of it in those terms. If you want a traditional shade tree, I want to rest underneath this tree in the middle of June and I want it to be cool with a traditional maple leaf to it. Autumn blaze maple, I think is one of the best for this region. Grow, it takes our wind. It doesn't get leaf tattered. So many of the maple varieties just get torn up by the wind. Yes, they'll live. The book says, yeah, they'll grow. No problem. But the wind makes them look terrible. So a lot of them I've called out of our mix here at Waters Garden Center, at least. I just said not worthy enough. Yes, it will live. There are a couple specimens around town, but we won't sell that curse to our customers. It's just not a good variety for here because of the wind factor. A little bit of aridness with that new growth in spring. Hit that spring wind and it just shreds the leaf. Not so with the autumn blaze maple. It's a bright red. It's the fastest growing of the red maples. A new maple that we're starting to, well, I was going to go red. That's purples. Let's go to the last of the reds that I have for you. How about that? Bradford pear. It's an ornamental pear. It's just starting to show off. Now, this is the last tree to turn red in the fall, and then it will, it'll, it'll kind of crescendo around Thanksgiving, and then it will drop its foliage bright, bright red. It has a bright white flower in spring, great shade tree, and then the last tree to turn red in fall. 
Okay, those are the red trees. We'll go with some Q&A after the next segment. At the bottom of the hour, we'll give you all the purples, oranges, and golds. We'll be right back. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane, owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him every week for timely garden advice right for the gardens. Visit Ken where he can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Waters Garden companion plants for November are Vanderwolf Pine, Flowering Pear, English Ivy, and Camellias. Ice Angel Camellias produce amazing 3-inch rosy blossoms with petals that radiate out from the center of Camellias deserve front yard status or admired on a patio or deck. Well adapted to acidic soils beneath oaks, native junipers, and maples. Loves shade gardens, containers, and raised beds. Shop in store or online at watersgardencenter.com. We believe retirement means more time to garden and plants make you happier at Waters Garden Center. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our McMinn Manzanita. Part of Waters' expanding native selection, this is the big, bold manzanita you find growing throughout Arizona. A local evergreen growing wild with the classic red bark for a style and drought-hardy landscape. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love lots of native plants, they love to shop. You've been listening to Ken Lane, the Mountain Gardener. Green thumbs learned while working in the Family Garden Center. Now welcome back to the Mountain Gardener. Okay, so we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each week with your garden questions and lots of questions going on. All those uh, newbies here mm-hmm. that are coming in, they don't, they've never seen frost before. So right. now they're coming and going, what happened to my plants? Why are they discolored? What happened? They were supposed to be beautiful. I thought they were tropical. No, we're a four season climate, so I'm sure we got lots of good questions this week. Mm-hmm. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Good to be here. What have you seen? We just turn that uh, for the vlog people uh, so they can see your name badge. I don't know that you can even hey. see it. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking fabulous, my dear. Oh, fabulous. Thank you. Oh, yeah. You've been unloading pottery all week. We have been. So the the 2023, wow. believe it or not, it's hard to think of that. Pottery just landed, so we're, <laughs> we're stocking, get it going, kind of uh-huh. have it all going. So these are fancy glazed pots. It mm-hmm. looks like will the this whole uh, bottleneck of of the ports coming in, yeah, things coming, supply chain is is starting to ease up. Yes, it is. So we're starting to get more more. Mm-hmm supplies more often that kind of stuff which is where we want to be Mm -hmm. so yeah we definitely got new pottery in so it's a good time to peruse that yeah especially if there's certain colors you're looking for certain sizes you're looking for you want to match things up yeah the sooner you come in and shop yeah you want better selection the more you're going to have that ability to do that because it's this is not one we restock every weekend i mean it's (laughs) You Two or three it, times yeah. a year, that's it. Right. So, so you should explain to folks um, to pottery. So, so pottery, folks that have let's say from the deserts, mm-hmm. they're used to that uh, Mexican clay, that red clay with a charcoal. What's the difference in quality? Are there different qualities of oh, clay, and yeah. how do you tell? Of course, there's different. Yeah, of qualities, course, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> so the the wonderful clay, the um, Oh, what's the, the Talavera, all those pottery, beautiful. And they work wonderful in the desert areas. But as we're experiencing, we get frost, we get snow, we get moisture, we get rain. And if you don't have a good quality pot that's been high fired, moisture gets in there. And then we get the freeze and thaw and the expanding and the cracking. And that's where you get the cracking, the crazing um, on your pots. So, yes, you definitely want to invest a little bit more money to get a higher quality pot um, that's going to hold up. I mean, we've had some pots, what, like 20 years? Yeah, too long. We're starting to get tired. <laughs> so I'm getting tired of them. I want some new colors. I know. <laughs> but it's worth the investment to have that pottery hold up. You don't have to worry about dumping it, taking it into the garage for the winter yeah. or protecting it. You can leave it out year round, uh, plant in it year round. Yeah. And, and be fine. So the right container. So your Italian clay, that red, your the thing, the the pots that your grandparents grew in, mm-hmm. those do not winter over here. They crack because of that freeze thaw cycle. Your Talavera, the the fancy Spanish uh, mm-hmm. kinds of German pots, yeah, they break in the winter here at this altitude. They freeze and thaw. That's more for right. Phoenix. Mm-hmm. Uh, your high fired uh, Malaysian Italian. Uh, 
uh, uh, Chinese, Vietnamese, mm -hmm. uh, Indian pots, or they're high, good quality clay, and they send them to the kiln. They're thicker, higher quality clay, and they go through them. And they don't, they don't crack. Right. So they, they're going to be a little bit more, mm -hmm. but you get years of oh. worry-free gardening yeah. out of them. Definitely, definitely. So Thank yeah, you. come check your selection yeah. now because uh, it's the best time to look. You know what I love about pottery? What? Moving they're it? beautiful. Oh, no, that breaks back <laughs> looking. But we, we carry, we, we specialize in resort size or, or large home mm -hmm. size containers. So they're bigger right. than normal. They're heavier than normal, but they're bigger mm -hmm. and they, they last. But they're beautiful. Even, let's say, this last cold just took out all of your geraniums. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful with or without plants. They're right. so pretty. It's sort of the colors, the textures, right. the they're gorgeous. They're pieces of art mm -hmm. that you garden in. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Questions? Check them out. Questions. Beginner freezing and fine. Dan would like to know, does he need to mulch around his peonies, roses, and other perennials for the winter? Yeah. And when would he get that mulch on? Yeah. So, so your timing's right. So yes, now. Um, I mean, the ground isn't going to freeze for another month. I mean, yes, we get frost. You saw a little bit of snowflakes. Yeah. You see some weather, but the ground is not going to freeze like ice. You're not going to get a permafrost kind of thing. So that happens in December, January. Mm -hmm. So you got some time. Take some time. Do it. You, the book says a two to three inch layer on top of your flower beds. And what that does for you, folks that are not are new to this freezing area, this freeze-thaw cycle See, if we're in the Midwest, it freezes and stays frozen. You're good. You don't have to do anything hardly. Here, because of the freeze and the thaw, the ground will freeze at night, thaw during the day. All those roots in that top layer of the soil, that top four inches or so, it breaks all those root hairs that were forming in there. Yeah. So you're like, you're damaging the plant because of that freeze thaw. It's, it's an altitude thing. It's not a four season thing. It's a four season with this altitude and the freeze and the thaw. So you want to insulate two to three inches, take a mulch. Uh, manure could be used uh, this time of year, probably. Mulch and cedar bark and some of those are better. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but two to three inches over, over those delicate plants. I would say roses would benefit from that. Uh, lilacs, things that bloom in the spring. Mm -hmm. Just nice, nice, pretty oval kind of round shape around it. And it, it just insulates that plant. The worms will be attracted to it. It'll add more. It just does a lot for you over the long run. So, Dan, yeah, get on it, man. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Pick a nice day and get out there. All right. Paula in Prescott Valley uh, has a question about watering. So yeah. she has several things that are new in her yard, Good. trees and shrubs. Right. Wants to know how you water those now and through the winter. Sure. And will that same watering schedule hold true for trees and shrubs that are established, been yeah. in the ground for a few years? So we, I just changed, had a doctor's appointment um, earlier today. They, of course, they kept you waiting. I'm there for an hour on my phone. I went, okay, you know what? I'm here. What can I do? I changed my <laughs> irrigation while I was sitting there in the doctor's office waiting to get in. So we've got the, one of these fancy mm -hmm. Wi-Fi remote, whatever, very sophisticated. Yes. Uh, and complicated. Mm -hmm. So I changed that out. And what I did is I moved all the cycles, there's like nine valves, up six hours. So what I wanted was I wanted to move everything to the middle of the day watering because it's usually not freezing here. I mean, right. here at this elevation, even in January, it's 40, 50 degrees. Yeah. At night, it's 19 degrees, but during the day, it's nice. I'll water during the day. Mm -hmm. I was watering like uh, uh, containers every one to two days. I backed it off every four days. The landscape, trees and shrubs, we were watering every five to seven days. I moved it to every seven to 10 days. So I just, a eh, couple times a, a month, two or three times a month, watering your roses, your trees, your shrubs, your vines, plenty. And, and, and in the middle of the day, you're not going to damage your systems. You're not going to have ice forming out of those drip heads. Uh, containers, I went to... Basically a couple times a week, mm -hmm. something like that, uh, in the middle of the day. So that's that's what we did, and that works really really well for us. We do water through the winter here, especially for Paula. New things. Right. If you had a new thing in the ground, those roots have not grown out far enough yet to really make it really robust. So we can. I know we've had some moisture this week. 
but that might be it for two months. Right. You never know <laughs> here in the mountains. So if if you if you have a really heavy wet storm or something, maybe you cut one of those out. Go once a once a month. But really, uh, if if a plant goes into cold when it's really dry, you'll get what we call winter kill or winter damage right. or winter burn. Mm -hmm. Several names, but the tips of those plants, the the branches will will die back. The heart of the plant will stay alive. Mm -hmm. uh, but but the easy way to get around that is just keep it moist. Right. If you see a real cold cycle coming, like this week. Water before the cold gets here. A hydrated plant goes to the cold far better than a dry plant. It's kind of counterintuitive because you wouldn't put your, yeah. your little puppy dog out there and <laughs> hose them down with water, but you do with your plants. If you're one of those strong plant parents and you're trying to nurture and care for your plants like a puppy dog, stop doing that. Treat them like a plant. Water them, hydrate them, and they can take care of themselves. Yeah. Uh, even those plants that hibernate underground. Mm -hmm. They're going to benefit from what staying moist through that winter. Right. They'll come out better next spring by just sporadic water in the middle of the day. Out of time. Great questions, Paula. Thank you. Ken and Lisa Lane, The Mountain Gardeners. We'll be right back right after this. You're listening to Ken Lane, aka The Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week in Prescott at Waters Garden Center. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain gardens. Waters Garden Companion Plants for November are Flowering Pear, English Ivy, Camellias, and Vanderwolf Pine. Vanderwolf is related to Arizona pines with fluffy foliage. It's remarkably resilient in dry Arizona soils. Makes a graceful specimen in yards or expansive estate landscapes. This distinctive pine, long, twisted, silver-blue needles covering the dense branches. Carefree and easy to grow. Shop by store or online at watersgardencenter.com. We believe you're braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think at Waters Garden Center. Trees prefer a locally delicious plant food, and the really big trees prefer you get it from Waters Garden Center. Your plant luck changes the moment you step through the doors. You can actually feel it happening. Time slows down, your neck muscles relax, and the radio plays better music. It may look like we sell trees and shrubs, but what we really sell is the perfect day. Waters Garden Center, here in Prescott, the place where people who love to garden, they love to shop. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Join the conversation every week as he answers timely garden questions. Email Ken a question directly from your phone to his desktop through the web at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Now welcome back your host, Ken Lane. It's surprising, but there's a couple things, a couple different things eating trees and your shrubs, the woody material in your yard. Now, I've had two customers this week, actually three, that came in with, with these issues. One, mistletoe. Mistletoe is bad. It's worse. It's, it's as bad as I've seen it, and it's spreading. So mistletoe is a parasite. It's a plant that comes in and it burrows into the actual structure of an oak tree or a hackberry or it can be in pine trees, junipers. It's certain things. It's got a favorite flavor, but the roots go down, not into the soil, but down underneath the bark. And now it becomes one with the plant, its host. And so if you were to spray big green globs, usually there's two types of mistletoe here. One is leafy, one's not leafy. Looks more like a Spanish broom or or a succulent or, or an air plant or something. But they both feed off its host the same way. If left unchecked, mistletoe will actually kill its host. If it, it can take many, many years, but eventually the, the, the parasite wins. Just like if you get a parasite in your gut or in your heart or in your anywhere. It's eventually, you can go for a while, but eventually you collapse. Trees are the same way. This is really important. Uh, you need to be aware or you can lose that big majestic emery oak that's evergreen oak that's just so nice. Um, you, it can affect your junipers and just really take them out, really disform them. What to do? If you've got these big globs, do not spray them with a weed killer or you will kill the host and the mistletoe. They are symbiotic. They are the same. They are one. What happens is when mistletoe grows into that, let's say it's a branch, 
about 18 inches on either side of that glob, of that mistletoe ball, is the roots. So if you can cut that mistletoe out, you go back about 18 inches, cut it off, it won't come back. You just now got rid of the host. Now get that off your property or burn it or do something. Don't, don't keep it around. Uh, but that's the easiest way to get rid of it. Sometimes mistletoe gets right into the heart, the trunk, the main crotch, the, brain, the main structure of the plant. So you can't really cut it out. What do you do then? Uh, well, now they make a product called Florel. Florel is not a weed killer. What it is, it's a, it's a growth hormone. It's, it, it's a growth regulator. So what it does, you spray the foliage on much like you do a weed killer, but it doesn't go down into the structure of the tree that you're trying to protect and kill off the roots. It doesn't affect the roots. It just burns off the top growth. And it, it affects the mistletoe for about a year. If you've got this kind of program, you're probably going to spray that tree annually with Florel Growth Regulator. And we've got it at the garden center. We're really specialized now. It's the only product out there that's rated for, that's labeled for mistletoe. But you can't kill it or it'll kill its host as well. So you either cut it out or you spray it with Florel. And that I would say those kinds of trees that have... Uh, a lot of mistletoe in them, I would say spray, not, not spray them with a floral, but also fertilize underneath with the all-purpose plant fruit, that 744 all-purpose. It's a granular. You spread it out underneath the drip line, and this plant will now actively grow. And many times you can get this plant to grow past or grow through or keep growing. It'll actually grow and try to suffocate the mistletoe. So you can get a tree to last decades uh, by, by doing that, so fertilizing cutting it out, or spraying with Florel. That's how you deal with, with, uh, with mistletoe. It's eating trees right now. The other one, which is super unusual, I've had two customers this week, porcupine. Porcupine is out eating trees. I had one customer, they, the porcupine is stripping off the bark of their fruit trees at the base. So they come in at night. They're nocturnal. You never really see them. And they plop down and they just eat the, the cambium, the, the wood, sweet wood underneath the bark. They love that taste. They come in and eat that. Or another one, a customer saw this porcupine, witnessed it. I witnessed right up through a smoke tree and started eating the tree from the top. When he got done, after about a week's worth of eating, there was no smoke bush or smoke tree left. Ate it right down to the ground. So these these kind of plants, they, they like trees and shrubs, sweet tasting ones. They like apples. They like uh, uh, populus, uh, uh, aspens. They like elms. So there's certain flavors they like. If you see that and you see damage, you, you probably won't see the porcupine. They're kind of like the size of a badger. They're pretty big, like a small dog or a really big cat. Uh, they kind of lumber around. And their bristles aren't always up. They're usually down, kind of walking around. So they're kind of difficult to ID right off the bat with a black face. Um, if you see that where they're seeing damage, put some wire, put some an obstruction around that that keeps them off. Uh, so you need to discourage them from keep eating that same spot. They seem to be singularly focused on eating that bush or eating that tree until the bark finally gets girdled. They finally eat all the bark off around this, this entire tree. It's a 20-year-old apple tree. And in a week's time, comes back every night, eats six inches of cambium, six inches of bark every week. And by the time you get done, the tree just dies next spring. It's terrible. So if you see that, kind of put it on your radar and come talk to me if you get in trouble and I'll help guide you through it. Got more after this. The Mountain Gardener, your source for timely garden advice right for higher elevations. Guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Water's companion plants for November are English Ivy, Camellia, Vanderwolf Pine, and Flowering Pear. Flowering Pear starts spring with dazzling white flowers, shady green leaves in the summer, and brilliant reds in autumn. Even the winter bark is attractive. This exquisite tree is ideal for lawns, lining driveways, or specimens in small spaces. Shop the most trees in town by store or online at watersgardencenter.com. We believe if plants die, it's our fault. So bring it back at Waters Garden Center. 
You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert, Ken Lane. Mountain gardening is very rewarding, with a few of Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts sure to turn your thumbs even greener. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. All right, back with Lisa Waters Lane. We come and learn so much from this segment, her segment. She just shares what's going on in her gardens, what she's been doing, uh, what what other folks are talking about, just sharing uh, insider tips that she shares. So you get two perspectives, not just me, the mountain gardener. So Lisa, the mountain gardeness, goddess. <laughs> mm, probably not. Maybe the sacrum, sorry. I was going to say, lightning bolt's going to come down. Yeah. So anyway, welcome back to the studio. Thank you. What do you got for us this week? What are you thinking? Well, so we did have our first frost. Yep. So uh, I went through our yard and I, I pulled out our tomato plants. Yeah, it was so sad. <laughs> Pumpkins, <laughs> that's so out. sad. Yep. Yeah, pumpkin. I pulled out peppers. the zinnias, yep. the peppers, the sweet potato vine, all those things that were looking so pretty just finally went, <gasps> yeah, we're cold. If it gets below... 40, really, 45. They're going, I'm not happy. Right. So right. they like it to be 100, not, not, uh, not, <laughs> not, not, not pull, towards freezing, mm-hmm. especially so cold and snow. Right. So we have all these empty pots, which is kind of sad because you know, cause you're still out there, even though it's fall and winter. Sad. It's happy to refresh and redecorate. Well, yeah. But you hate to look. You've had all these beautiful pots going, and now they're empty. So it's time to fill them with some, some stuff that can take our cold. Decorate with corn stalks <laughs> and uh, what, what's Thanksgiving kind Thanksgiving of stuff. stuff. Or I see you're pulling out some flowers. I did. So I brought, we got a new shipment of pansies and violas yeah. in. So I wanted to bring that for, I thought, a little more unusual color. So this one is Ultima Radiance Red. Yeah, it's pretty. Uh, so this is a pansy. I really like that color. So it's a uh, yellow inside with a red outside. So it's a two-tone, uh, just really unusual color than you normally just see in your pan. You usually yeah. see the yellows, the blues. But I just thought this one was so pretty and so it's different. different. It's a new. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just, and it's, it says this is a pansy or viola. This one this, is a pansy, even gotcha. though it's got a smaller head. It's got a lot of heads. Um, probably has... I don't know, 20 flowers on there. Mm -hmm. One little six pack, lots of flowers. Lots of flowers. So I just like the color. Um, Really pretty to to put with your dark, put an evergreen shrub in there and put those around it. Good idea. Just be really pretty. Alberta spruce, little tiny Christmas tree Mm -hmm. looking thing with these skirting around it. You'd have uh, winter long color. And you got to convince people. I know. They don't believe. So just share. (laughs) They lost all their flowers to the cold, and they're going, I'm going to plant these. I'm going to lose these, too. The answer is... No, you're not. These love the cold. They love the cold. So pansies and violas take our cold temperature. They can take snow sitting right on them and then be beautiful the next day when the snow melts off. So it's definitely one you can plant now. It goes all the way through the season, up until May-ish, usually. They don't like the heat so much. Yeah. Um, but I've had them go, all the go all the way through May yeah. too. So. We've actually have some coming back. They were mm-hmm. more protected back in the back. Yeah, they're still going. It's been over yeah. a year, so they they made it through. But mm-hmm. yeah, most of them. We just tell you, yeah, they're not going to like summer. That's when you put your zinnias and your right. geraniums and your petunias. And they're going to be happy. Yeah, they are. So, so can I share something real quick just sure. for folks that maybe don't know? Flower quality, flower sure. size. How do you tell quality? Yeah. So obviously they're in bloom. They're actively growing. They're watered. They're not wimpy, laying over. Those basically, but the size of the container they're grown in has a lot to do with it. The soil mix, mm-hmm. how long you hold on to it and root it out so it's fully rooted. We're growing in six pack, but a six pack is not just a six pack. Now, for those that you know, your grandparents always said, I only plant six packs. I want lots of them and they'll grow. Well, they were really tiny cells, and each there were six of them. So there's six plants in this little pack, the mm-hmm. six pack. But there's different sizes mm-hmm. of cells. So we're growing an extra large cell. So the roots are larger, more established. This is critical yes. for things that are cooler, or you're going into real extreme heat or, or real cold. The plants that have a bigger root actually perform better and grow better, get stronger, get fuller, have more flowers faster. 
plant, uh, vegetables that have bigger roots. Mm -hmm. They're going to they're going to produce stronger, faster, longer right. uh, for you, especially when you have the temperature swings. It's mm -hmm. it's this it's the summer and the winter yeah. where they perform far better. So your your uh, six packs here at Waters Garden Center are better quality. That's what we're noted for. We're going, oh, six packs a six pack. That is not yeah. true. Well, they're cheaper over there. Well, yeah. It's because there's different qualities. So, oh, yeah. so you've got to know what you're planting, especially this time of year if you want success. Mm -hmm. Have a better plant yeah. and you'll have more success. Anyway, I and go on my soapbox. When you box. pull these out, they have a nice root yeah, to them. Full. You know, it's not yeah. some dinky little root that's going to go, ah. Yeah. It's fully rooted out in there. So you know it's going to do well. Whatever you do, stay away from pony pack. So there's one with four cells, itty bitty little tiny roots. Those don't grow here. They're <laughs> terrible. Yeah, I know you gardeners said, yeah, I planted one and it took me three months to get it to finally bloom. Right. But if you gone with a bigger six pack, it would have taken you two weeks. Yeah. And it would have been glorious. Uh, but anyway, so there's different qualities. And, and oh, the yeah. size of the root is the start of, the soil is the start of mm -hmm. the quality of the plant. Right. Anyway, go go back to you. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> well, I'll show you. So this one's Viola. This is a Viola. I brought this one in too. There again, because of the color. It's, it's kind of like a real soft denim blue color. That's very, very pretty. That's a good way pretty. to describe it. Yeah. So I thought it was very pretty. We also have the Johnny Jump Up ones, which are usually the two-tone, the purple and yellow, uh, orange and purple, white and purple. Those are really pretty too. But I just, this is an unusual color. So we should show folks for the vlogs, if you tune in online where you're watching this, I don't know if I can get those in the camera. So the pansy is <laughs> a little bit bigger flower. Yeah. That one, a little bit bigger flower, probably twice the size, three times the size of, of a viola. Mm -hmm. But a viola actually has more flowers. Oh, yeah. It makes up, and they're better at reseeding. Yes. So they'll come up other places. Right. They'll just seed themselves so well. So violas or, or your uh, grandparents called them Johnny jump ups because mm -hmm. they would just jump up out other parts <laughs> of the yard. Uh, I don't know why they call them Johnny. We should research oh, that. That's a good question. Plant trivia. Mm. I would call them Joan jump up or <laughs> something else. I'll have to research Peter, that. Peter Pansy. <laughs> I don't know. It's, we're getting crazy. You know, what's funny is it because I pulled all the tomatoes out, like we were yeah. saying, and underneath all those tomatoes, there were some little violas. Oh, really? Little They'd receded from the pots yeah. last winter. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? That's they, amazing. They were just kind of hanging out there in the summertime, and now they're like, oh, yeah, I can do this. I can yeah. see the sun. I will <laughs> bloom more for you. You should mention, too, since you're doing flowers, what are some vegetables that are cool season, snow-loving vegetables that people yeah, can put at so edibles. Most of those are your leafy. Um, so your kale, cabbage, those kind of things, your uh, lettuces do really, really well. And you can start harvesting almost right away from yeah. those guys. Yeah, they, they grow so fast. With yeah. this kind of weather, mm -hmm. they grow so fast. Yeah, so the more you harvest on them, the more they're going to grow. Yeah. Uh, so you get some, a lot of your herbs, you can still put herbs in sage, yeah. parsley, rosemaries, thyme, lavender, uh, lavenders, yeah. you betcha. So you can put those things in now. Everybody goes, oh, I'm growing the window in a kitchen. I'm like, you can put them outside. They'll be fine. Yeah. So you can definitely. Uh, in a container, just under that overhang by mm -hmm. your front door, sunny southern exposure, they're going to grow like crazy. You'll, they'll be a weed. Right. They'll love that cold night, bright days. Mm -hmm. Uh, they'll, they'll produce really well. That's folks from the desert areas. They don't realize the, how to how to deal with four seasons. Right. So yes, you lost some plants. Too. I don't know if you saw the uh, basil <laughs> the vaporization. <laughs> I mean, just instant gone. Yeah. Uh, but now you can do it. Now the the, right. the, the, the sages look amazing. The mint look looks really amazing. Good. So. And the other thing is you can plant, maybe you put some edible kale in, yeah. put some violas and pansies around it sure. too. You can actually eat your pansies and violas, a little salad with some color in there. Yeah, you yeah, it seems it. wrong. Eating no, flowers. No, you can do <laughs> My head has a hard time wrapping around flower, eating flowers. I know. Sniffing, smelling, touching. But they're really pretty when you put them uh, in they're your impressive. salad or put them as a little garnish. Garnish. That's a good idea. Yeah. I can do garnish. You can do garnish. I mean, everything tastes better with ranch dressing, let's face it. So, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so I'm basically saying don't be afraid to mix a little bit of color in there in with your, your uh, winter veggies. Yeah. It'd be really nice. Well, thank you for the winter tip on flowers. So they sure. got some dead things from space. You can still plant oh, and have yeah. color blooming, especially close to the house, the mm -hmm. windows where you're going to look outside sipping tea. 
and watching snow come down, these guys are going to go, look at me, I'm cold, but I'm blooming. So <laughs> yeah. thank you, Lisa. Ken and Lisa Lane, the Mountain Gardeners. we we'll right back after this. Look for more tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts through Ken's website. Podcast the show, read his weekly garden column, or follow him on Facebook and Instagram at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. I used to be cocky and actually dared to beat the big boxes at their own game. Since the beginning, we were known for the very best plants in town. But with youthful ambition, we added a line of inferior plants, contractor grade, that matched the box stores and beat their prices. We failed miserably. The plants were side by side. Waters hand-picked quality at the higher price and the inferior plants at the lower price with astounding results. The inferior plants, not bad quality, just not full and nice, were still there a month later. The hand-picked quality plants, they had been restocked twice and the bench was empty again. The youthful cockiness, it's tempered and with age comes wisdom and knowing who you really are. Waters Garden Center doesn't compete with the marts and the boxes. We simply grow the very best plants our family is famous for. We will never offer inferior plants. Cross my heart. Pinky swear. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road, here in Prescott. Gardening has always come natural to me. Green thumbs, they just run in the family. So when the Family Garden Center was offered to Lisa and I, we jumped on the opportunity. I've always loved coming to the nursery, being surrounded by all the beauty, helping the backyard gardener and passing on some of that natural magic that happens so easily for me. We aren't just selling plants, we're offering garden success. My name is Ken Lane, owner, and you'll feel the magic here at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road, here in Prescott. Welcome to the Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane. Gardening in the mountains is different. Listen to Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts guaranteed to make your gardens more beautiful than ever this year. Now for better advice that works locally, Welcome your host, Ken Lane. You'll notice a change right now as well in your interior plants, your house plants. We've, we've closed the windows. It got cool. I mean, okay, it got cool. Now it's warming back up. But as we cool down and the furnace is running more and more, you'll notice that you, you need to water your house plants more. There's something about that furnace, and I know it's been dry. It's Arizona. We're used to 10% humidity. But you take a dry, arid climate, and then you put a, you run that air through a furnace, and it breaks down the moisture even more. You can feel your skin, just your, your hair. You can tell that you are drying out yourself faster when the furnace is going. So are your plants. And so they'll perspire more. And you'll notice it'll get weird. It'll be that back bedroom that's kept cool as normal. It's like you, the water pattern hasn't changed. But the the house plants that are in that that living room where you've got the, the furnace and the fireplace going at the same time, that pellet stove, you'll notice they dry out faster. Just be aware. Watch. If you've been watering every 10, 14 days so far, it might be you're watering once a week all of a sudden, or that plant just collapsed. You should put it, that's a gardener, just knows it's in, you're working with the environment, not against it. And you're trying to help your plants change to the, to the seasons. And that's one that you want to put on your radar as we've, as that furnace kicks on more and more, you'll need to watch. This is a time when you want, this is when you invest in a moisture meter. A simple $10 tool helps you keep monitored you know, how fast things dry out. And it will change. You'll find that it dries out faster than it has been. So just, just watch that one. If you really get into trouble, and I would say this is a good product, not just for house plants. They, it's also good for your outdoor plants that are exposed to more frost, even though they are frost hardy, they'll come through fat, better, stronger. They won't get that brown tip in January. If you spray them or coat that foliage with cloud cover, cloud cover is a clear, how do you describe this? It's, it's described as an anti-desiccant in the, in the industry. It keeps the plants healthy and strong. What it does, it coats it in like a clear latex. 
the, the foliage, the leaves, and it keeps that plant from perspiring outwards from their, from their stems and their foliage. And it gives it a nice glossy sheen to it. I, I like to spritz a lot of my new plants. I keep a bottle of cloud cover on the garden shelf. And as I plant things, I'll spritz it with this cloud cover. And it greatly reduces my transplant shock. I'll do that with my uh, outdoor flowers. So I don't really put it on my vegetables per se. I put it on the flowering and shrubby tree thing kind of stuff. I, I, I put it on my Christmas trees. So if I buy a new, new living tree or my cut trees, I'll get a bottle of cloud cover and I'll spritz that foliage because again, it keeps the foliage from perspiring or from, from expelling all of all the moisture within the structure of that plant. It just seals that in and it makes, gives it a nice glossy sheen to it. it makes it look healthy and robust and green. So look at that. If you've never played with anti-desiccants before or plant protectors, this one's called cloud cover. There's several on the market, Wilt Stop, Anti-Stress 2000. There's, there's a lot of them out there. I, I Personally, I prefer the cloud cover because it doesn't change the color of the plant. So some, some of the sprays, you'll spritz that on top of the, let's say a blue spruce, and all of a sudden you'll lose the blueness. It'll turn green on you. So I noticed cloud cover doesn't do that. It keeps the, the integrity or the, the color of that plant, yet still locks in the moisture so that the plant, it, it seals out the cold so that frost lights on top of the foliage, on top of that plant. It doesn't allow the, the frost to burn the plant. Yeah, so this is important for evergreens, especially, or your winter blooming kind of plants. And then it locks in the moisture on your exterior plants, but in this point, on your house plants. It really keeps them, if, if they're looking kind of dirty and they need to be cleaned up anyway, dust them off, spritz them with cloud cover, and they'll look like a million bucks when you get done. They look like a brand new, they look like they're just, rock, they look like they came right from the garden center. I mean, just a little bit of work really makes them look good. So on my garden shelf, I've always got a ready to use uh, a spray bottle of cloud cover. In fact, an insider secret, we just had a whole load, an entire semi of evergreens show up at the nursery. These are great big eight foot spruce down to little tiny mugo pines and Alberta spruce and everything in between. They come off the truck and we tie them up when they're shipped so they don't break. They keep some it keeps all the branches intact, and then we can ship more in that truck. But the second they come off that truck, they're on the back dock. Before they even go into, into, into stock, we go through the entire inventory, everything. We put a hose-in sprayer filled with cloud cover because it helps them reduce his transplant shock. It takes the pressure off. It's not so much the transplant shock while it's here at the nursery, we're doing it so that when you take that plant home, you're going to install it in the ground. It is, it's like open heart surgery. It's in this container. It's now it's a big old 25 gallon pot and it weighs 150 pounds. And you drag this thing home, you beat it up in the back of the tailgate, and then you rip it out of this pot. You throw it into a soil that's probably awful. It's going to go into some transplant shock with that cloud cover. It keeps that from happening. And a lot of folks go, well, Ken, you're, your plants live. I mean, other other folks, their plants die. Well, that's one of the reasons. I mean, we, we do a lot of little tricks that we do, but that's one of the insider tricks of the trade that, that we do to make sure that just that plant takes in that landscape and that new surrounding, whether it's a house plant or, or a new tr big old tree, cloud cover really does make a difference. So, okay, enough said about that. We had a little moisture earlier in the week. It wasn't a lot. I was expecting more rain than that. But we do get some rain. We get some moisture going into uh, usually in December, the end of this month. I mean, I've been snowmobiling on Thanksgiving weekend in Prescott, Arizona. I mean, right here. I mean, it can, it can happen. It's a little early. Usually it's later in December that that can happen. You folks in Flagstaff and Williams, you know what I'm talking about. This is the time, this is why, this last week, this is why you wanted to put your fertilizers and mainly your weed preventers on the ground. 
so that when rain comes, it'll work that into the ground for you. So things aren't really going to keep growing at this point, but there is going to be a, a, a water event, a, a storm that comes through, puts enough moisture into the ground where those winter weeds will just ignite and take off. They've been kind of warm. They don't, they, don't like the, they don't like the heat. They like the cold. So your dandelions, your foxtail, uh, some, of those, some of those winter weeds, they need it to be cool before those seed will germinate. Well, it's pretty nice right now. I mean, it's like the perfect time. All it needs is a little moisture, and those weeds will go berserk. You want to put your weed and grass preventers down, and, and don't work them in. This is really hard for you gardeners. You just chuck it on the ground, walk away, and you wait for a storm to come like this last week to work it into the ground for you. I mentioned this in passing last week, but I think it it needs to be reiterated and, and, and expounded upon. We've had so much moisture this last summer, it's flushed a lot of the nutrients out of the ground, and it has set the stage for a lot of seed production. So I predict we're going to see evergreens that are really yellow. They'll yellow on you this, this winter because of lack of food, so you need to fertilize, and you'll see weeds take off on you. Unless you get ahead of this thing, it's going to become a real problem. It's going to become a burden. We're out there in January and February with a hoe working the soil when you should be inside sipping tea and baking cookies and enjoying yourself. You just This one step takes care of all of that. But you need to get it down before the moisture comes, before the seed germinates. Because once the seed germinates, now you're in, into hoe and you're into work. If you can get it on before that weed uh, germinates and, and takes root, you won't have that issue. So there you go. That's that's my insider tips for this. I can be right back with more garden tips, tricks, and techniques. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center, located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Arizona Cypress. If you want low-maintenance natives, easy care, and reduced water use, then this is the evergreen for you. When planted in rows, they block the wind, traffic noise, and make the perfect privacy screen. Comes in an Arizona blue, easy to grow, and prefers monsoon planting. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love native evergreens, they love to shop. You might say I've been part of the local garden scene even before birth. My father started the very first garden center in northern Arizona and ran the family business with my mother, even while she was pregnant. The nursery was my preschool, with many joyous after-school hours spent playing in the family business. Waters isn't just a garden center. It's a safe place for kids and pets alike. My name is Lisa Waters Lane, owner of Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road, here in Prescott. You've tuned in to The Mountain Gardener with local garden expert Ken Lane. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions that are sure to make a difference in your gardens. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. All right, so as we wrap this thing up, uh, some, some things we're doing in the, at the Lane Casa. This is what we're doing in our gardens. So we've had some frost damage. We're pulling those plants out. And you really do want to clean up. Now, don't feel like you're rushed to do this. But I do want, after the leaves have dropped, when the tomato plants have just wilted, when the cucumbers are just vaporized, pumpkins are they're, they're gone. And so pull those things out. Don't leave them there in the flower beds, in the vegetable beds. Rake that stuff up. And, and the reason that you want to do that, you want to expose the soil to that cold. If it's going to lay dormant for a season, for, until next March. March is the next big planting season. You're putting in all that extra, all the initial you know, carrots and uh, radishes and broccoli, cauliflower, lettuce, Brussels sprouts, kale, cabbage. They all go in in March. Potatoes, they go in in March. April, not apricots, but uh, artichokes and uh, all, all those things. Rhubarb, they all go in in March. Right now, you can plant. This is another season like that. So March is, you know, it's bright days, cold nights, just like now. 
So right now you can put in those, those kind of plants. You can harvest broccoli for Christmas dinner. You plant it now. And you can have kale all winter, parsley all winter by planting it now. But really, if you're going to leave that soil, you don't want to leave dead plants in there. Dead plants have, they might have had some bugs on them. They might have had powdery mildew, like my pumpkins had powdery mildew on them. I have this beautiful pumpkins. I'm going to keep them. They're so beautiful. I, I'm going to keep them through Thanksgiving. Into I might paint them red for Christmas. I don't know. They're beautiful. They're bigger than normal. They're, I grew them myself. So, But the plant itself... I'm going to take out of there so that if I did have bugs, if I did have a powdery mildew, if there were things there, I'm going to let it ex get exposed to the cold. I want that ground to freeze. If I'm growing things there, that's different. There I might mulch it up and put some manure in between the rows and kind of get things ready. But right now I've, I'm pulling those things out. A few of the areas I'm going to put in like spinach. I love fresh spinach. I love fresh uh, broccoli, cauliflower, oh my gosh, kale. Kale, you can harvest that. We, we're big juicers. Right through winter, every every few days, you can have foliage coming off of that and juicing it or using it. And so we're planting our pansies. When the zinnias are gone, pansies are going in. The ornamental kale is going in. The snapdragon, so you can have color right through winter. Uh, but the main thing is cleanup is good. Uh, don't leave your leaves. Now, it's a bit early, but in another three, four weeks, the, fo the leaves will have dropped and they're covering your lawn, covering your flower beds, covering your... Don't leave those there. That's a place for the insects to... The, the aphids will get real cold. They'll crawl down to the bottom of the tree, bottom of the flowers, bottom of your roses, and they'll, they'll hibernate underneath all that leaf mold, all that, all that litter down at the bottom of the, of the plant. Don't let them do that. Let them get exposed to the cold. The, the, this cold this week will actually get rid of like grasshoppers. They've been terrible the last month and a half. This will really thin them out. So they're cold and they don't like it. And so this will kill them off. So you kind of want that. What we need is some a serious, week-long, just chill, bone-chilling cold in January. Not, not now. Uh, so that it can kill off the bark beetle in your pine trees. It can kill off. It can really set back those insects. But that's the reason you're cleaning up. Don't don't feel like you got to rush out and every leaf that drops, you're picking it up. But you do want to be strategic. So we've pulled our tomatoes and peppers and things that got burned back by this last few frost. Yeah, they're gone now. And so some of those areas will free it up to plant some new things. Some will just leave it idle so that the cold can kind of thin out some of those, those bugs and, and disease and things. So anyway, that's it for this show. Ken and Lisa Lane, we, we kind of hang out here at Waters Garden Center. And we can help you with whatever we might have missed on the show. And then uh, we love talking to fans of the show. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center, located in Prescott, 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener. Waters Garden Companion Plants for November are Camellia, Vanderwolf Pine, Flowering Pear, and English Ivy. English Ivy stays waxed green through winter, forming a lush ground cover under large trees. Quickly climbs walls, pillars, arbors, and fences without support. Use English ivy to cascade over hanging baskets or tall planters with a perfectly shaped Alberta spruce in the middle. Shop exciting evergreen vines in-store or online at watersgardencenter.com. We believe small business can win against impersonal box stores at Waters Garden Center. Waters Garden companion plants for November are Vanderwolf Pine, Flowering Pear, English Ivy, and Camellias. Ice Angel Camellias produce amazing 3-inch rosy blossoms with petals that radiate out from the center of Camellias deserve front yard status or admired on a patio or deck. Well adapted to acidic soils beneath oaks, native junipers, and maples. Loves shade gardens, containers, and raised beds. Shop in store or online at watersgardencenter.com. If you want a more fruitful garden, increase success in your landscape that just feels better, then tune in every week to The Mountain Gardener. Years of tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts are guaranteed to make your gardens nicer than ever. Listen to this podcast or read Ken's weekly garden column by visiting watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. 
Thanks for tuning in.